Well, let's do this. First mental health topic lecture in the last like year and a half, and I'm uh, I'm pumped about it. So uh, I will first start by saying I would like to welcome you to this video. Anybody who may be watching it, whether you are watching it live or whether you were watching this VOD shortly after or several years down the line, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. I am Dr. Mick. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in the states of Illinois and Nevada. I am also the president and co-founder of Starline Therapy in Las Vegas. I am a former clinical assistant professor of psychology at Northwestern University, where I was on the core faculty of the marriage and family therapy program for a few years. And then I went into private practice in 2019. Obsessive compulsive disorder, which we're going to talk about today, is a topic that I consider myself to be an expert in. I have been a therapist at this point, uh, at the time of this video, for over, <clears throat> over nine years. And over my nine years, I have worked with many folks who fit the diagnostic criteria for OCD. And I have had a lot of success working with folks who are struggling with this. And so my goal with this lecture today is to bring some of my expertise to this. This is designed for a lay audience. It is not designed for fellow therapists. Those fellow therapists may benefit from it. It is more designed for folks who have no understanding of what OCD is or have seen misrepresented or misrepresentations of OCD to have a better idea of what it is, how it works, and uh, I'm going to take some questions about it as well. So I'm really excited to do this video. Uh, I ask that you, you know, if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you think this is something that somebody in your life could benefit from watching, please share the video. Uh, but I do hope that you will find it helpful in some way. Before I start the lecture, I have to make sure that I include a disclaimer, and this is very important. This video is not designed to diagnose anybody. This is for informational purposes only. I am a therapist, but I am not your therapist. This is not an assessment of any one person, either here live or who is watching this video. If you believe <clears throat> that you fit the diagnostic criteria for OCD, you need to make sure that you talk to a mental health professional who is qualified and has the credentials to do a thorough assessment. Um, this is a, if this provides a nice starting point for you where you are like, man, this really, like he, it feels like he's describing me. That's okay. Uh, and that's okay to have that information and to go to a therapist and say, you know, I watched this guy lecture about OCD and I just got me thinking about myself. And I was wondering if we could maybe talk about that, uh, or if I could uh, have an assessment done to see if maybe this is something that's affecting me. But this video itself is not diagnostic. Uh, you cannot walk away from this video and say, I have OCD just because it resonated with you. And I have to make sure that I'm very clear about that. This is for informational purposes only. If you need assistance finding a therapist, I have a video on YouTube about how to find a therapist. And if you need help figuring out how to navigate a first session with a therapist, I have a video about that as well, as long with other mental health uh, topic lectures. And I encourage you to watch those. And I will actually, I will have a couple of those linked in the description should you decide that you want to make use of them. A little bit about the format. What we're going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some background for OCD, which will make sense when I get there. I'm going to share a few facts about OCD that you may not know and that you may be interested in. I'm going to talk about the diagnostic criteria. I'm not going to take a ton of time on it, but I do want to show you all what it looks like. And then we're going to talk really, uh, the bulk of this is going to be what does OCD actually look like? Like how does it present? Why does it work the way that it works? And then I'm going to offer some ideas about like basically what does treatment look like for it? How do I talk to clients about it? How do I help them move from, hey, this is something I'm struggling with to something that they're better able to manage? And uh, that's gonna include some like charts and stuff. I'm also gonna kind of demystify this throughout the process. And I will also share a little bit about how to support people in your life who may be diagnosed with OCD and how to support yourself. Just some real basic tips for how to do that. So that's what we have in store for this today. And uh, I hope that you will enjoy it and that you will learn from it. So <clears throat> before we talk about OCD, I actually have to talk to all of you about uh, anxiety. Because one of the things that 
people don't generally realize about OCD is that it is founded upon anxiety. And so for any of you to understand how OCD actually works, you first have to understand how anxiety works. And so I have, um, this isn't like anything official, but this is language that I've developed uh, to talk to clients about this. And it's gonna make sense when I actually get into talking about the OCD aspect of this. But I call it the anxiety mitigation protocol. And what that basically is referring to is when I experience anxiety relative to some stimulus that's in the environment or to some thought that I have, what steps do I go through or does the human brain really go through in order to try to mitigate or lessen the anxiety that we are experiencing? As a quick little background, anxiety is really just an emotional experience that we have when there is uncertainty in our environment. Anytime there's something that we can't lock down or fully understand, our brain gets really anxious because from an evolutionary standpoint, to not understand something means that you are at risk. So we developed this really cool physiological state that tells us there is uncertainty, there's potential risk, I need to do something about it. I need to I need to basically move from uncertainty to certainty. Well, how does that work? So in a basic sense, the way that the anxiety mitigation protocol works for humans is we have a certain stimulus, or I'll call it a thing, in the environment that is uncertain. And I'm going to put that in uh, parentheses here. Okay, so that thing is uncertain. We do not have a full ability to understand what that is. And so then what happens is that creates an anxious response. And what anxiety often will sound like in our head is it's a lot of what if questions. Okay, what if that thing happens? What if I don't know what this is? And we ask these what if questions as an attempt to answer. Because if we can have an answer to the what if questions, our brain generally goes, okay, cool, we understand it. Thus, we can lower the experience of anxiety that we have uh, going on in our body right now. When we experience that anxiety, basically those what if questions and then the answer to those what if questions turn into addressing stimulus. Okay, so what I mean by addressing the stimulus is that we will find reassurance or we will find certainty in the environment. So what this generally might look like is, let's say um, I hear a noise in my kitchen and that creates an anxious response for me because I don't know what it is. It was a weird noise. So I now ask myself like, oh man, like what is what is this? What, what was that? What if, it's, what if it's a robber? What if something just fell off a shelf? Like what is, I don't know what this is. And so then I seek reassurance in certainty by addressing the stimulus, by going out into my kitchen, seeing that something fell off the shelf. And as soon as I have certainty around that and I've assessed it as not being dangerous, then the anxiety goes down. And this is something that probably should relate to literally anybody watching this video because we do this many, 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 many times a day. Anxiety is a part of the normal human experience. It's a very useful thing. In fact, if you didn't experience anxiety, you would actually be more at risk uh, in general throughout the day because you wouldn't be addressing certain things that are uncertain and making sure that your environment is generally safe. Okay. Now, an important thing to understand about this is that this reassurance and this certainty needs to be in some form connected to data. 
So one of the things that we need to do is we look at our environment and we see that there is actual data and evidence to support that this was something that happened and that this stimulus has been addressed. Okay, so once I look at it, I go, something fell off the shelf. I have addressed the uncertainty on this. Okay, I'm good. I, I feel better. I know what it is. And now I know what to do, okay? Which leads me to the final part of this. So if I have to sort of draw an arrow that goes over here to the final point is we then address it and we continue on with our life. And one of the things that we do in that continuation is we commit the data to memory. So we actually take this data and we commit it to memory. And we basically say, okay, so that noise means something fell off the shelf. I went and checked. I saw that something fell off the shelf. I'm good. I commit it to memory. We're fine. Another example of this on the day-to-day -day life, and this is going to connect to when I start talking about the OCD part of this, is if you think about locking a door uh, when you're going to bed, if you think that the door is unlocked, right? There's uncertainty. I don't know if door is locked, okay? So again, so stimulus, right? We're right here. Oops. So stimulus is right here. I, I think the door might be unlocked. I might be unsafe. So then we experience that anxiety. Well, what if? What if it's closed? What if it's open? And then we go and address that stimulus. So you walk down to your door, you check the lock, right? And maybe you see that it's locked. If you see that the door is locked, that's data. You commit that to memory. You go, okay, cool, door's locked. You go upstairs, you're good. If the door is unlocked, then maybe you lock the door. That's the way of addressing the stimulus. And then you go back upstairs or you go back over to your bedroom and you continue on and you commit that to memory. I check the door, the door is locked, I'm good. For the vast majority of humans, this is the type of thing that happens without us even thinking about it. We do this all the time. Think about how many times in your life you lock the door or you lock your car, right? Think of how many times in your life you, you, know, you turn off the stove when you're working, uh, when you're cooking in the kitchen, and you see that you turn off the stove, and you go, oh, okay, turn it off, we're good, and you commit it to memory and you move on. Or you have that moment where like you, you know, you walk out of the kitchen, you finish your dinner, you go to start playing video games, and then you go, wait a second, did I turn off the stove? And you go back out to the kitchen, you check the stove, you see that it's off, you go back and you resume your life and you play your video games and it's really not anything bad that happens, okay? I share this because this is going to be particularly important when we start talking about OCD because with OCD, the anxiety mitigation protocol goes completely off the rails and goes haywire and doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. And it creates a whole lot of problems and creates a significant amount of distress for people who struggle with OCD. So I want you to keep this in mind. I'm going to, I'm going to keep this on this uh, page, but I want you to keep this in mind because this is something that is going to matter significantly when we start talking about the way that OCD works. But you have to understand anxiety and anxiety mitigation in order to really make sense of why OCD is as debilitating as it is and why it's something that we actually consider to be a disorder and is not just something, it's not just something where like a person's just kind of quirky about something, which is another thing that you're going to hear me talk about significantly throughout this video, which is that obsessive compulsive disorder is not anything that I would ever wish even on my worst enemy. It is a really debilitating uh, disorder it's an incredible struggle for people who deal with it. it is not really something for us to take lightly and to just dismiss by using it in general language by saying it as like, well, I like to have my desk clean, so I have OCD. It's not really how it works. And you're going to see why by the time we get to the end of this. So there's a before we do that, though, there's a couple facts that I want to make sure that I share with all of you before we even talk about the diagnostic criteria for OCD, because I think it's very important for us to put this information in context. Okay. The first thing is, uh, when does OCD tend to show up for people? A lot of people don't understand this. The mean onset for anxiety is actually about 19 and a half years old. So it is actually relatively rare for us to see it in children. It's not impossible, but we do tend, we do sometimes see it, but it's very rare for OCD to ever be diagnosed prior to a child being 10. 
Um, 25% of OCD diagnoses, though, do happen around 14 years old. So what you're really seeing here is OCD sometimes shows up in like mid to late teenage years or middle age, like when we start getting to or early middle age, like talking about like 20s and whatnot. So sometimes people will ask me the question like, well, is this something that I've always had? Is this something that I've been struggling with my entire life and just didn't realize it? And the answer to that is that may be true, but also it doesn't necessarily matter because people only really seek therapy and treatment when it's gotten bad enough that it's caused significant distress in their daily life. So whether you had this when you were 10, doesn't really matter because if you're 34 years old and now it's really affecting you and you're starting to notice these things, that's really what matters because we're gonna treat now as opposed to trying to develop a bunch of insight from where it came from, okay? So yeah, mean onset's about 19 and a half years old. It doesn't mean that it can't be diagnosed earlier or later than that, but that is generally where you're going to see it. Onset after 35, is rare. It's not that it's not going to be diagnosed after 35 years old, okay? But it is rare that you're going to see it. Generally, if you see OCD show up later in life, it is tied to a particular event. So we might see OCD type symptoms or OCD itself show up in the aftermath of like a traumatic instance. Uh, where PTSD doesn't necessarily fit. We're also going to talk about the differences in PTSD and OCD because those things, there's a lot of comorbidity there. But seeing OCD develop in uh, late adulthood is very rare. You're usually going to see it somewhere in teens, early 20s. Now, that said, I have worked with plenty of folks throughout um, the spectrum of age where they fit the diagnostic criteria. I've worked with teenagers. I have also worked with people into their 30s and up even into their 40s who are struggling with this. So I think it's really important to, uh, to understand that. It is very common, and I really wanna make sure I make this distinction. Co-occurrence happens most often with other anxiety disorders meaning like social anxiety, generalized anxiety, panic disorders. It also can show up sometimes with bipolar. Uh, and there is, there is such thing as a co-occurrence, okay? So you can, you can be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. This isn't the case for all diagnoses. There are some where if you're diagnosed with one thing, you can't necessarily be diagnosed with the other thing. But in this case, we often see OCD show up with anxiety disorders, and that's going to make sense based on what I talked about here with the anxiety mitigation protocol when we start going into it. So we see a lot of co-occurrence with anxiety disorders, with panic disorder, with bipolar. And what's actually very interesting about um, OCD is that one third of people who are diagnosed with OCD also can have tick disorders. This does not necessarily mean Tourette's. Tourette's is a tick disorder. However, Tourette's is marked by a uh, by having both a vocal and a motor tick. Ticks are an involuntary um, like vocal noise or uh, words or uh, a tick can be something like a, a head jerk or a you know fingers kind of doing this like there's different types of ticks, but it's actually very common. Uh, one in every three people who are diagnosable with OCD, on average, also fit the description for a tick disorder. I'm not really going to go into um, the specifics on that. It's not something that uh, we're going to talk about for the purposes of this, but I do think it's kind of interesting to think about. If you're a person that's been diagnosed with a tick disorder, it can often mean that there's a chance that maybe there's going to be some OCD type tendencies that may show up, uh, or you may even also fit the diagnostic criteria for that. The linkage itself is not something that's fully understood, but it is something that we see a lot of comorbidity with. Uh, would you say that OCD is a result of anxiety or would that be more common correlation uh, despite it being causation? It's a really tricky one for me to answer. Um, there is, anxiety is basically always present when we're talking about OCD. So 
I think it's really hard to talk about OCD without anxiety. So I am more in the camp that it's not so much correlation. Well, it's correlated, but there is some anxiety that causes it. It's more of the mitigation protocol that goes offline, which I think will make sense. Uh, I am not sure if RLS fits a tick disorder off the top of my head, Floaty. Um, does Tourette's always have a verbal tick? Tourette's is marked by both motor and verbal tick. So, uh, yeah. But the thing to understand about that, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this isn't a lecture about Tourette's, is that vocal tics aren't just words. South Park kind of skewed people into thinking that that's what it is, and it's not. It's uh, Sometimes it's just like a, <clears throat> or like a, uh, it's, it's, it's a vocal tick. It comes from the, the voice, but it's not necessarily like words or anything like that. Okay. Um, something that's also very important to understand is that OCD rarely co-occurs with depression. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, first is that Depression works entirely differently than anxiety. And the way that the process of OCD happens for a person doesn't really make sense in the context of how depression works. Depression tends to move people into a space where they do not act much on their environment. They will tend to be a lot more catatonic. There's less like racing thoughts so much as like ruminations. And it's just, it's very rare to see a person who fits the criteria for like chronic depression also show signs of OCD. And uh, it doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's a lot rarer. You are more likely to see OCD develop in the context of anxiety and with anxiety disorders. I also want to be very clear that you can be diagnosed with OCD and not be diagnosed with other disorders. You do not have to have a generalized anxiety disorder alongside OCD. It can be a standalone. These are just some common things to think about as it relates to this. And I, there are some contextual pieces of information that I think are just important for people to understand about this before we start talking about um, kind of what this looks like. Uh, I'm a big fan of context. I think you, you need to know these things before we start talking about how it actually works. So I hope you haven't skipped ahead of this part if you're watching the bot. Okay, so um, I think it's also uh, the final thing that I want to say about this in terms of like the uh, background information is that OCD tends to be severe and debilitating. It causes daily distress and it interferes with daily functioning. Now, this is often the case for basically any disorder, but um, this is where I wanna talk a little bit about just a few misconceptions. Um, OCD is not, I'm quirky and I like to keep things straight on my desk. OCD is if I don't have everything perfectly in order on my desk, I will literally not function or focus on anything else until it is absolutely perfect. And even when it is perfect, it still isn't perfect. And I still am going to focus on it. And it's never going to get to a point where I need it to be in order to do what I need to do. Think about yourself sitting at your desk for four hours doing absolutely nothing because you are so obsessed with making sure that your desk is perfect. Okay, This is not, well, you know, I like to make sure I check the lock a couple times before I go to work. This is, I will literally turn around halfway on my way to work and be two hours late to work because I went home to go check the locks on my door and then I checked it and then I left again and then I got out of the parking lot or I got over to the gas station and then I turned around again and went and checked it again. These are real stories. I, this is real things that I've seen. This is, I will literally, I, I, it's not just I want my apartment to be clean. I will literally throw away items that I just bought because they make my environment not what I need it to be. Okay, 
So it causes, it's severe and debilitating, it causes daily distress, and it absolutely interferes with being able to do the things that you want to do throughout the day. It can ruin people's lives. And generally, when you see people show up to therapy, it's because these things have started to take hold. Okay, And so when we talk about onset, it's generally when these types of things start to show up, where I notice that I am... I'm checking my locks constantly. I notice that I'm washing my hands to the point that they are literally raw and the skin is falling off. It literally hurts to wash my hands and I continue to do it. Okay, it's things like that. Is it a similar case with bipolar disorders or can they occur with OCD too? Bipolar is one that you will sometimes see OCD um, have uh, show up with. The thing that's a little bit tricky about uh, co-occurrence between OCD and bipolar is that when people are in a state of mania, particularly if they're diagnosed with bipolar one, some of the things in the grand, like some of the things they do and some of the grandiosity associated with it can look like OCD, but isn't actually OCD. Uh, so bipolar diagnosis with OCD is a little bit tricky, but we do see it happen uh, with bipolar, particularly more than we might see it with something like chronic depression. Would you say that the criteria for an anxiety disorder would support an OCD diagnosis, even if less than would be needed for an anxiety disorder diagnosis? Uh, no, because, and the, the way that I have to answer this putt dog is, um, you fit the criteria for OCD if you fit the criteria for OCD. We don't use other diagnostic criteria from other disorders to give ourselves an idea that it might be this. And I think that's going to make sense here. Um, in a, in a second when I show the, the criteria. Uh, Mona, I'm going to answer that here in a second. So um, I just want to be very clear that like OCD is not quirky. It's not funny. It's not a badge of honor. It's not something that people are proud of when they struggle with it. Uh, the folks that I see and have seen over the last nine years that fit the criteria for diagnosis for OCD are miserable on the whole. There are some folks where it's a little bit more minor because the thing that they're uh, fixated on is maybe not as uh, debilitating, but never in my entire therapeutic life have I ever had somebody with OCD say, I really love this. I wear it as a badge of honor. I'm proud of it. I brag about it to my friends. Oftentimes people will hide it. Um, and they will do everything they can not to rope people in their lives into it. And despite their best efforts, they still do. Uh, the, the people who come to see me to work through this are really, really, truly st struggling. So do not say you have OCD unless you have legitimately been assessed as having fit the criteria by a mental health professional. Is it common for ADHD to occur with OCD? I do not know the numbers on it, but I can tell you that I have seen them go uh, hand in hand, uh, albeit a little bit more rare, but, but yes, um, they can, they can exist together. All right. So I've started to talk about the diagnostic criteria for it. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but I do want to share with all of you what the diagnostic criteria for OCD is. I want to make sure that I am very clear that the the DSM five is written for mental health professionals. It is not written for a lay audience. You should not, if you are not a therapist, you should not go access the DSM-5 on your own and read it. You should only really ever be exposed to the DSM if you are in a context like this one where I am about to explain these things and put this in context. I do wanna share this though because this is the criteria that I have to use as a therapist in order to render that diagnosis to a person. I can't just give a diagnosis because it's a gut feeling. The person actually has to fit this. And so if we are going to provide the F42 uh, ICD code to an insurance company, you've got to fit this. And I want to go through this not to belabor it, but because I think it's just important for anybody watching this to understand. Okay. So Obsessions and compulsions, I'm going to give you the DSM's definition of those because obviously they're the O and the C part of OCD. 
And these things need to be present for a long period of time. This is not just like you had a week where you noticed you had some extra intrusive thoughts. This is over a prolonged period of time, you notice that these things are pervasive. And again, there are ways for us as therapists to be able to assess these things, both through, um, usually through questioning, but also through observation over time. So obsessions are defined by two things. They are defined as recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive or unwanted, and that in most individuals cause marked anxiety and distress. So this means that you have thoughts that are essentially being pushed into your consciousness that you would say, I don't want them to be here. Uh, whether it's the, the door's not locked, the stove is on, um, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be caught with child porn, even though you've never looked at child porn in your entire life, or I'm going to be, uh, found out for something that I said on Twitter when I was in high school, and that's going to come back to bite me and I'm going to lose my job. And it just forces its way into your consciousness in a way that you do not want. Any thought that pops into your head that you don't want is technically considered to be intrusive. But when we're talking about obsessions, we're talking about these things coming back over and over and over and over and over again, and that they are not necessarily even realistic, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Number two, the individual attempts to ignore these or suppress these thoughts, uh, often by using coping strategies that they may have learned from their therapist or that they have learned over time. Um, they don't work. Okay, so your normal anxiety mitigation protocol stops functioning. Okay, so I'm going to bring this up again just to show you because I think you know it's important to have the repetition on this. This protocol that I described to you does not work. And the only way that it works and the only way that a person even experiences even temporary relief on this is to engage in an associated compulsion which is going to be defined here okay so compulsions are defined as repetitive behaviors hand washing ordering checking or mental acts such as praying counting repeating words silently these are all very tangible behavioral manifestations that the individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly and the emphasis on this is on repetitive okay and they are often something that a person will do and it might work for a little bit and then it stops working and then they do it again but the difference is that instead of it feeling like a choice it almost feels like something that a person has to do and this is often the language that i will use when i'm speaking with clients who are trying to figure this out is when you're doing these things does it seem like a choice or are you feeling compelled by a have to? I have to check the stove. I have to call my friend. I have to say this word five times in a row. I have to do this. And it's this very strong urge. It's almost like I've had a I've had people describe it as it's like a lasso was tied around your stomach and you're being yanked by a rope constantly to do it. It's like you, you, you have no way of being able to take that, the sl put slack on the rope. It's just a constant tension and you just get yanked. Take the trash out, check the trash, check the lock, check the lock, check the lock. Uh, and it's, and it comes from that anxiety with the intrusive thoughts. Okay. So these behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation. So sometimes they can be in reaction to the intrusive thought or the, the obsession. Sometimes they are proactive. A person starts throwing magnets on their hard drives to prevent a possible um, FBI search down the line, uh, even though they have really no reason to be afraid of that. They will throw things away because they don't want that thing to be something that they injure themselves on when they're walking to bed at night, even though it may be something that's totally benign and not in the way at all. Stuff like that. These behaviors or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent or are clearly excessive. That is an incredibly important sentence to understand. These are the things that help us differentiate what we would consider common or normal neurotypical behavior with with compulsions 
So the things that you do are either like completely outrageous, but you do them anyway. They don't actually neutralize the anxiety, right? So the anxiety mitigation protocol, not engaged. Or they happen so often that it really just doesn't make sense in the context of what the person is worried about. Okay, So these things uh, have to be present for a person. And then there are these other criteria. Okay, so there's a lot of depth that comes along with this. So part B, okay, the obsessions and compulsions have to be time consuming or cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, which I already talked about, right? This is what I mean when I say that it's very severe and debilitating. It really just, it cuts into your daily functioning. It makes it so that you can't do things that you want to do. Literally, you will, you will engage with the obsessions or compulsions even when you do not want to. And a lot of times people will describe this as feeling like they are completely out of control. C, the obsessive compulsive symptoms are not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. This is also an important point. This is generally included in almost every diag uh, diagnostic criteria for any uh, mental illness. If you are consistently under the influence of drugs and alcohol, it is almost impossible to diagnose these things. And in some ways is impossible to diagnose these things because it's impossible for us to attribute the obsessions and compulsions to your sober brain. So people become paranoid when they do certain drugs. Alcohol gets rid of certain inhibitions that might start making things a little bit more salient to a person. So if you are consistently under the physiological effects of a substance, or if these things only show up when you're high or drunk, then we can't, we have to kind of rule it out until we see if those things are present when you are sober. When it says another medical condition, this is where I'm going to take a second here um, and part with D to talk about how we differentiate this from other disorders, because this is where PTSD often shows up. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how PTSD develops. In fact, uh, trauma is actually one of the lectures that I'm going to be doing here in the future. But there can be obsessive compulsive tendencies that come out as part of a trauma response as opposed and because they can be explained as a trauma response, we can talk about them as being obsessive and potentially compulsive, but we are generally going to go with a diagnosis of PTSD if the other criteria for PTSD fit. If the other criteria for PTSD don't fit, then we're going to look at this as being more OCD, okay? But if we can explain the things that are happening logically using other medical conditions, then we're not gonna go in the direction of OCD. Right. So that gets us to D, right? The disturbance is not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder. So uh, generalized you know, worries connected to generalized anxiety disorder or appearance, body dysmorphic disorder and eating disorders are often um, considered in their own spectrum. And if you fit the criteria for a eating disorder or body, body dysmorphia, you're often not going to see OCD diagnosed. Um, there's a lot here. OK, like substance abuse and stuff should make sense. Some really uh, severe psychosis and mental illness is also going to be part of this. But this is where a therapist is super important because we know how to engage in an assessment that's going to help separate this out from other disorders. What this generally means, Isaac, is that if you do fit the criteria for PTSD and the obsessions and compulsions that you are experiencing are better explained by trauma and your response to it, then we are likely going to go with PTSD. It is very rare, uh, if ever, certainly not in my experience, uh, to have PTSD and OCD diagnosed simultaneously. Because again, if you look at criterion C and D, if we can better explain these things using something else, then we don't render a diagnosis of OCD. And the reason for uh, differential diagnosis is because otherwise there's sometimes so much overlap in certain things that you would then be diagnosable for like 20 different things when in reality that's not necessarily the case. Okay. 
I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this process of how this differential diagnosis is done because this is not for a general lay audience to need to understand. This is why therapists, this is why you have to see a licensed therapist because this is what we learn to do. We learn how to do, how to make these distinctions. We learn how to make sure that it's not one thing and it is the other. It's not an exact science, but it's something that we learn how to do. It's not something we expect you to be able to do. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this. This is why you see a mental health professional when you're struggling with these things, because we literally take hours upon hours of classes to learn how to do this stuff. Uh, as far as it relates to medication floaty, I can't really answer that. Um, that's where we would want to have like a psychiatrist involved. Can OCD show up after a traumatic event? Yes, it can. And just because a traumatic event happens in a person's life does not mean they're going to develop PTSD. So yes. Again, this stuff is very tricky, but I share this with you because um, I, I think it's really, really important to just have some background on what your therapist is using and what they're assessing using in order to determine whether you fit the criteria for this or whether a person fits the criteria for this. So if a person has been diagnosed by a mental health professional as having OCD, it means that they fit the criteria that are listed here and that that person has done an assessment to ensure that it's not necessarily something else. Okay. This is why you have to talk to a professional. This is why if you're experiencing this stuff, do not, under any circumstances, talk to a life coach. You need to go to somebody who has the actual legitimate credentials and training to be able to do this, especially with something like OCD. Okay, There's a reason that I specialize in OCD, and it's because there's a very specific uh, treatment that comes along with it that actually wouldn't necessarily work with other things. Uh, for example, like some of the stuff that I might do with a person with OCD, if they actually fit the criteria for PTSD, it may not necessarily work or could potentially make the PTSD a little bit worse. So a, a, a medical professional, a mental health professional is going to know how to navigate this and is going to do that. So I share this with you all just so you have some idea of what this looks like and to reiterate that point. Now that we've established that, I want to talk about how OCD looks in uh, contrast to what we would consider to be the typical anxiety mitigation protocol. And I'm going to share with you all a few concepts uh, that go along with this when I start talking about treatment for how we can help people really move through this uh, in a meaningful way. So it only rarely occurs with depression, but does often. Uh, I wouldn't say often, it can, Jinx. Um, and again, this is where having a doctor help you with that. It can occur with bipolar. It's, I'm not saying it doesn't occur with depression, it's just rare. And so we'd probably be more likely to see it co-occur with bipolar type 1 than we would bipolar type 2. But again, this is where you have to have an assessment on your subjective experience because it really it very much depends. These things are not an exact science in the same way that like dealing with heart disease is. Okay, so we're going to go back to the anxiety mitigation protocol, but this time we're going to talk about the OCD version. Okay, so OCD anxiety mitigation protocol. Now again, just as a reminder, anxiety mitigation protocol is not an official medical term. It's a term that I use to help people conceptualize how this works. Okay. So this time we have the stimulus okay, from the external environment, or it can be internal. Okay. The stimulus itself, right? So physical, or it can be conceptual. I think about that as like um, it can be uh, physical or mental. So this can sometimes, well, actually, I'm going to deal with that part next. Okay. So again, we have a stimulus, 
Maybe we have a certain thought that comes into our mind. And what that does is it creates anxiety. Okay. However, I don't know. I'll talk about that in a second. Sorry. Okay. Then what we have, we have part two, right? Where we address the stimulus. And then what we would typically have is we continue on like what we talked about but with OCD this does not happen okay what happens is a person goes to address and the following happens We're back to what if? We're back to anxiety. In fact, anxiety might actually increase. We're back to the narrative associated with the obsessions. Okay? So then what happens is a person will then move to address but then what happens is they go back here so what happens is you never make the jump back to continue or if you do it's after many iterations of this Okay. This would absolutely be described as a feedback loop, Floaty. It's a it's a it's a feed it's a snowball rolling down a hill and it's pretty brutal. Okay, so I'm gonna explain a little bit more about why this is the case by making some notes on this. Okay, it's a real trap for people and it gets really nasty really fast. So the first thing I want to do is I want to put obsessions and compulsions into context here. Okay. So the stimulus itself can be an obsession or the obsession can arise from it. The anxiety and the what ifs that come along with it can be the obsession. You can also have this in both. The address becomes the compulsion. And we also see the address over here be the compulsion. Okay, and that's gonna make sense here in a second. So when we have the anxiety that comes along with this, there's a couple things to keep in mind. The anxiety in the narrative that comes along with this is often disproportionate to reality. Okay? So I'm going to use an example of uh, locks to illustrate this because I think it's kind of the easiest one and it's the most tangible, but I'm gonna use a couple examples throughout this illustration. So the what if or the anxiety associated, let's say with home safety is, what if somebody breaks in? Or What if I get killed either when they break in or whatnot? Okay, notice how both of those starts with start with what ifs. Now, very important, very, 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 very important for me to make sure that I say that these two things are possible. Okay, we're not going to say that these things aren't going to happen. But the possibility that these is going to happen is disproportionate to the following, which is, what if nothing happens? Or what if nobody breaks in? Come on. 
Okay, and what I'm going to illustrate here is that these two things are also possible. Okay, but I'm going to draw what I call the OCD pie. Y'all like pie, right? I'm going to draw the OCD pie here. Here's your pie. We're going to call this, it's the OCD pie and it's the pie of possibilities. Okay. What tends to happen in a, well, actually, I'm going to draw the OCD pie and I'm going to draw the typical pie. Okay, so this is typical. This is OCD. What tends to happen is that in a typical pie, a non-OCD pie, this what if is considered to be a sliver of what is possible. And we might consider this to be a realistic view. Right. If I leave my door unlocked, if I live in a relative, I understand that this is relative to context. If I live in a relatively safe area where break ins don't happen, what the typical response is going to be is I am going to wait this. Where. The majority of the possibility pie. Is that this is very likely not going to happen. So I'm still going to check my lock. I'm still going to make sure that my that my home is relatively safe. But when I consider possibilities, my pie looks like this. And most people can move on with their day, right? Like if I forget to lock my door at night, there's a chance somebody could break in, but it's probably not going to happen. And I can look at that realistically. However, with the OCD brain, we disproportionately weight the green. So what we do is we build this big old story and we obsess a whole bunch over what if somebody breaks in? What if I get killed? And we have this big old pie that says, this is super likely. And now, and then this chunk of the pie is going to be different based on something that I now want to share with you, which is it's going to be based on the level of insight that a person has on the obsessions and the compulsions, which are these. Now, this is a very important part of the assessment criteria, and this shows up when I push people into considering other possibilities. Okay. So you have some people that have what we would call good or fair insight, which is where a person recognizes that the beliefs that they have about these possibilities are probably not true or may not be true, meaning that they understand that the possibility of this green is going to be closer to the pie on the left. So they do understand that the majority is going to be closer here and maybe their pie looks a little bit more like this. Okay, so it's weighted still disproportionate to we'll call it reality. Uh, and I'm going to put a uh, I'm going to put a a pink sliver here to sort of show you guys this, right? If we consider this to be the reality slice, the green is going to be a little bit bigger relative to that. But they're still going to stick proportionately to what if nothing happens and what if nobody breaks in. Then we have people with poor insight. These are people who think that their beliefs are probably true, meaning that they're only going to see this as a smaller sliver. And over here in this person's mind, this is this is a little bit bigger. I'm realizing that like I'm there's probably not a need for me to have both of these pies here. Okay. But their chunk 
of this is similar proportionately to this. Okay, so there, what they start to do is we start to look at these as being less of a possibility and more as a reality. And the proportion starts to get really shrunken. And then we have folks who have absent insight or delusional beliefs where they are convinced that their impulse or their obsessions are true. And this is where we see a person who basically either completely overrides the other explanation to where this is basically a minuscule sliver. And this essentially, this pie becomes that. Okay. I hope this is making sense. And so what our goal is, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when I get to treatment, but I do want to, um, I do want to make sure that I uh, cover sort of the protocol first. Is what we want to do is help that person see, like basically flip to the realistic pie, to where the proportion is proper. But in a person, a person who's struggling with OCD is not going to see it this way. So the anxiety becomes a product of these pies that I have described to you here. Okay, so we see the disproportion in this, in that anxiety as part of that obsession. And the person will sort of obsess over that reality. So that's the point that I want to make about that. So disproportionate. The other thing uh, I'm going to include now is, and I talked about this, is the insight is related to this, right? So do you have do you have poor, uh, do you have absent poor or fair or good insight that's going to affect the level of anxiety that a person experiences with this? And then this is also where we're going to start to see an increase in the intrusive thoughts and obsessions associated with this that are going to fuel this and create an uptick in the anxiety. So not only is the anxiety present, but there are aspects to the anxiety with forms of the intrusive thoughts and the obsessions that jack that up, Okay, which is why I write obsession here on top of anxiety. Now, next, when the person goes to address it, what does a person with OCD's anxiety mitigation protocol look like and why does it go haywire? Well, it goes haywire in part because the addressing of it is not committed to memory. Okay. Or is improperly committed to memory but generally you're going to see it more as it's just not committed to memory okay and what we also see is that the address gets overridden by what ifs so a person might want to go check the lock on their door but they'll go downstairs, they'll check the lock, and then they'll go walk away from the door and they it doesn't get committed to memory. And then they go, and then they have what ifs that override it and they turn around and they go back, right? So when we see this what if and we see the anxiety narrative, that's what we're talking about here is the protocol, the mitigation protocol goes off the rails. It doesn't work because the person is not registering the reassurance that comes along with acting on the obsession. And so then you spin out into this feedback loop that seems like a nightmare to get out of. Okay. And this is what this looks like. Now, one of the things that sometimes can happen is 
people will take this feedback loop and this many iterations aspect of what I wrote, there's sort of an arbitrary conclusion or quantification that comes from this. And what I mean by this is sometimes as a way for people to develop a coping strategy to get through this, they will say something like, I have to check the door 10 times. And once they check the door 10 times, then they walk away from it. And so it's this very arbitrary reassurance that mitigates the anxiety that actually perpetuates this whole notion that until I check a lock 10 times, it's not locked. And that may be all well and good. You may hear me say that and go, well, there's no harm in that. You check it 10 times, no big deal. The difference is a person will do that no matter what. And I think that's the that's the point that I want to make here before we move into this next part where I illustrate this is this ain't it really doesn't feel like a choice. Okay, happens no matter what. It ain't a choice. At least it doesn't seem like a choice. It is a choice, and I think it's very important for me to say that. It is a choice to do the mitigation protocol that isn't working for you, but most people do not experience it as a choice when they're dealing with OCD. They very much look at it as, I have to do this. I do not have a choice. If I do not do this, then thing will happen disproportionate thing is likely to happen. So again, that's why you have to connect this to those pies that I drew. Because a person with OCD has unequally weighted a possibility and is believing that that is reality to a point where they now are off the rails with what they're looking for in order to address it. And there also, there is an absence of data here that a person's not paying attention to data that suggests that their proportion is off. Okay, so here's a, you know, a perfect example, right? Like if there is a person who say is afraid that um, having their home unclean is going to put them in danger. If my room is a mess and if I have certain things out in certain places in my home where they're not supposed to be, I am in, I'm in grave danger uh, and I'm... I'm going to be hurt. And that may be conscious and it may not. Well, what that person's not doing is they are not seeing that literally up until that point, they have survived. They have survived their environment. There have been multiple times where maybe the environment wasn't what they wanted it to be and they're just fine because they're here to talk about it. But with a person with OCD, it's very hard to get them to reality check that because they're so focused on the disproportionate idea that I'm in danger when my house is a mess. So there are times, so that's a great question. Do they literally not commit to memory uh, or is that just part of what sets it off? So it can be one of two things. It's a great question. Sometimes people will try to commit it to memory, but then that's where you see this override of what ifs. So the person commits to memory, they say, I locked the door, but then they go, oh, but what if I didn't? But what if I didn't? I believe that I did, but if I didn't, I'm going to die. There's going to be a break in, right? So this is what I mean when I say there's the override is I may remember it, but I don't trust it. What if I didn't? And then there are some folks who literally don't commit it to memory. They will they will lock the door, they'll walk away and then their, their anxiety is so they'll be like, wait a minute, I actually don't know if I did it. I don't know if I checked the door. I need to go back and check the door because I don't know if I checked the door. Both of them are miserable. What if I remembered it wrong is a great, yes, that's a phrase that I hear all the time, right? Like what if, but what if I'm wrong? What if tonight I didn't? I know I do it every night, but what if tonight I didn't? And this is really what, again, this is what separates this giant mess of a protocol with this one. Because again, typically what we see people do is there's stimulus, anxiety, address, commit to memory, look at the data and move on. The majority of us do this with basically everything in our life, even some of the stuff that creates significant anxiety. 
But then you get a person with OCD and it's okay, it's all well and good, but then you start having these confounding variables on the anxiety and on the addressing of it. And then this goes into this terrible feedback loop because it's not registering the way that a person's mind typically would, which is why I use the language. OCD is anxiety mitigation protocol, go off the rails and it stops serving you. Yep. Yeah, having a webcam pointed at the door lock would be a way to do it. The thing that's tricky about that is what a person's doing is they're reinforcing their anxiety. And a person with severe OCD, if they have a webcam on the lock, will say, I don't know if I can trust that feed. What I, I need to go make sure that the camera's pointed in the right direction. I need to go make sure that it's actually on. What if it's a video? Like sometimes OCD can look like paranoia. Great question. So what if a situation where that proves to be true, what can that mean for a person with OCD? Does it cause further issues? Yes. So one of the really terrible things that can happen is that I'm going to draw this pie again, okay? Because I think uh, the pie really helps illustrate this, okay? So remember, the purple here is um, is sort of like the, the reality that this kind of thing won't happen. And then the green is that it will. So what really sucks is if, for example, if a person says, I don't know if I left the stove on, and that's basically something that they they tend to obsess about and have compulsive actions over, and you know, 100, you know, 98% of the time when the person checks the stove, it's not on. For a person with OCD, if they have a moment where they go back and they check the stove and it is on, oh no. Because what that does is it completely reinforces the obsession. Completely reinforces where the person will look at you and go, see, this is why I worry about this. And instead of locking that in to the proportion of saying this was the 2% chance, this was the 2% chance that you were going to leave the stove on or if their house gets broken into because their door is unlocked, this is the 2% chance that that was going to happen. It has now become the 100% chance as a confirmation bias to the way that their pie is already proportioned. And that can wreak absolute havoc on somebody. And that's where we really have to focus in treating this on reality checking, on data, on facts, on proportions. It's, it's really rough when that type of thing happens. However, the other thing that can happen though is that can actually start, that can actually create a trauma for a person um, in so, to some extent, and then it gets very complicated. But a person, again, most of us, we look at these things and we go, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, sometimes shit happens. You know, oh shit, I did leave the door unlocked. Ooh, I gotta be careful next time. Person with OCD that's, that's latched onto that is gonna go, oh my God. This is why I have to check it 20 times because I messed up. And this is furthermore, furthermore, and I'm literally going to zoom out to say this because I cannot emphasize this enough. And I'm going to talk more about this in a second, but do not mess with somebody who has OCD. It is never a funny joke to lie about it. If a person is fixated on the stove being on, if you're a roommate of a person who struggles with that and they're working on it, and then you go into their room and you jokingly say, dude, you left the stove on. You are a asshole. Do not do that. You can set a person back a mile and a half if you do that. It is not funny. Now, if the person did leave the stove on, that's okay. It's okay to talk about that. You're not responsible for managing another person's mental health. But if you know that a person in your life is struggling with OCD, and you know what the thing that is focused on is, do not joke about it. It is never funny, and you are a terrible friend, and you have harmed somebody massively, okay? It's akin to like stepping on a oxygen line when a person needs oxygen in order to breathe better. Like you are just as much of an asshole as somebody doing that. Do not ever joke with a person about that kind of thing. And I hope in me talking about this, you're starting to understand why that's such a problem if a person does that. It's never funny. Do not do it.
Okay. So what I want to show you all really quick here is I want to show you what this process looks like in uh, real time. And I am going to use the door locking as an example, again, because I think it's the most simple to understand and it's the most tangible. But you could apply this really to just about anything. You could apply this to hand washing. You could apply this to, uh, apply this to your environment needing to be clean, a person's desk needing to be straight. It literally works with all of this. But I'm going to apply this model in real time. And we're going to look at something like door locking to do this. Okay. So our stimulus in this case is the door lock. Okay. And the, I'm going to do this vertically here because I think this is going to be a little bit easier for me um, to do. So that's the stimulus. Okay. The anxiety associated with the door lock is um, something that I'll talk about here and is uh Oh, sorry, I should do it this way. The anxiety associated with the door lock is, is it locked? What if it isn't? Okay. What if I'm, what if I'm in danger? Or there might even be like a compulsion of like, um, I'll be killed if not. Like sometimes these things uh, sound like statements. Okay, that's the anxiety. And then the address is to check the lock. Okay, and then there is the ideal, which is continue on. Okay, now we are going to route this through our new model here. So these obsessions and the anxiety that comes along with the door lock are going to be disproportionate. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw our little chart here that I've already drawn a whole bunch. Just to illustrate this, what we're looking at here is a pi that is disproportionate to uh, this is going to happen with a sliver of reality. And what a person's going to do is they're going to sort of act on that disproportionate and then depending on their level of insight is going to basically mean how severe this is, okay, and how intrusive this is. And so what's going to happen is this person, I want you to imagine this person, they have an intense fear and again, anxiety associated to what will happen if my door is not locked. And what this person does is they rationally in their brain. OCD is very rational, by the way. It makes complete sense to people who struggle from it. It doesn't look necessarily rational to people on the outside, but it absolutely does to people who have it. That person thinks, well, the way that I can mitigate this anxiety is to check the lock. And under normal circumstances, you would go downstairs, you would check that lock, you would look at it, you'd say, okay, I locked the door. It is locked. Right. So to use our uh, I'm going to I'm going to distinguish using the purple and the green and hopefully that'll help make sense of this. What would normally happen is you would check the lock and you would be like, it's locked. Or you would lock it. And you're good. Right. But. Unfortunately. With OCD. You check the lock or you lock it, and then that person goes, what if I didn't? Is it actually? Do I remember? What if blank? And then what that does is it goes right into the pie. Person uses that pie to make sense of this, which then sends us back to the obsession. And then when it goes back to the obsession, person goes back down and they check the lock. And then what they do is they go, they look, it's locked. I locked it. What if I didn't? 
even they may, if they check the data or whatever, they may check it and they go, oh my God, no. So what we want to do with this person is we want to help them understand that one, even if you didn't lock it, you're probably fine. But that the odds are, if you walked down to check it and lock it, you did do it. And one of the things that we might do for a person is have them do something to disrupt this feedback loop. And one of the ideas that I have often had for a person is you might say, what you might do here is go, you check the lock, you lock it. I know I have a lot of arrows going here, but then you take a picture or write a note on your hand with a date. Anything you can do to try to disrupt this feedback loop so that you can go over here to maintain. And the thing that we have to do and build in this process to go from here to here is we have to increase a person's distress tolerance. And the way that we do that is that person has to sit in the anxiety. Have to sit in the anxiety and not act on the compulsion. Instead, you continue on. Because you've made a note and you've taken a picture. And what you have to do is you have to integrate that into some self-reassurance. And I'm going to get into talking about treatment here in a minute. Okay, but that's what that needs to look like in order to disrupt that. But in an OCD brain, it goes into this red and it doesn't work. And that person checks that lock so much so that it stops them from going to work. They turn around on their way to work. Uh, I, have, I have seen people be midway at work and will literally leave work and skip a meeting to make sure that they lock their door. Okay. And what a lot of times people will say when you try to integrate these new things is that didn't help. Which is why we're going to talk a little bit here about treatment after I, um, after I answer a couple questions. Would you consider every step you take while walking unconsciously could be part of it? You need to make sure that those steps are conscious. Are conscious. So I am walking down the stairs. I am locking the door. I'm walking upstairs. The door is locked. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, can this include activities where it isn't repeatable, but rather happens 20 times throughout the day? Yes. Yes. Um, what if they add more locks? Would it help them realize they did or would it make it just worse? It depends on the person, but there's a good chance that it makes it worse because the thing is, guys, this is not about the lock. This is not about the lock. People without OCD don't understand this generally. It's not about the door being locked. It is about the anxiety, okay? Which is why I showed you guys and told you in the beginning, you have to understand OCD. You have to understand how anxiety works. All it is is anxiety mitigation that's not working. It has nothing to do with the lock. It has nothing to do with your, with your hand washing. It has nothing to do with your clean house. This has everything to do with anxiety management and making sure that we are mitigating the obsessions and that we are disrupting the compulsions. So adding more locks reinforces the idea that you have to you have to lock your door, but that's not going to do anything because the person's anxiety is related to the what if. It's related to this disproportionate pie that says that it is more realistic that I'm going to be broken into than is actually true. Right? This is, this is the real meat and potatoes of this. And when I'm doing work as a therapist with folks, this is often what I have to help move them into understanding, which is that this has absolutely nothing to do with how clean your hands are. This has everything to do with your anxiety associated with it, and the protocol that you've developed to try to mitigate that is actually causing you more problems. And so we need to develop a better protocol. We need to develop alternative strategies. We need to move the pie to a different proportion and we need to build your distress tolerance because if you have low distress tolerance, you're going to continue to act on the compulsions. Uh, it is really actually pretty hard to watch a person who has compulsions be prevented from acting on the compulsions. Uh, it can literally cause people to panic. People can become incredibly uh, physiologically distressed. Uh, it is really, really, really tough work, but it's work that a person has to do if they're ever going to break through it. 
If it did leave it unlocked, would you help or harm taking the fall, saying you were the one who left it unlocked rather than them, so they might not compound that behavior? It depends on how it manifests itself, uh, but that's probably not going to be a good idea because if you have a choice between it being locked and unlocked, you want it to be locked. But the person's not registering and reassuring the anxiety that it was locked. So that wasn't that's not necessarily something that would work. Do OCD obsessions tend to be long-term or get captured by new obsessions like every day or whatever? Uh, they tend to have patterns. They tend to be prolonged. Uh, and they tend to be a fixation on a, one or a couple things. It's not something that's like a new obsession every day. Um, that's not impossible, but that's going to be rare. So just make sure I'm understanding this. The obsession is over the what-ifs, and the compulsion is to mitigate it over and over, even if it's been properly mitigated. Correct. That is a really great TLDR for that. Yes. Your anxiety mitigation protocol has failed you when you have OCD. And so you continue to engage in the compulsions relative to the obsessions because there's not any reassurance that's happening. The answers, again, anxiety is moving from uncertainty to certainty. What's happening with OCD is you're making certainty something that is not really necessarily true. I didn't lock the door. I'm going to be broken into. This is going to happen. And people with absent insight, as we talked about from this, uh, from the diagnostic criteria, people with absent insight are going to struggle way more with this than people have good or fair insight. I've, I've worked with folks that understand that this is something that is problematic and they can understand, like, I know that the door is probably locked, but I still struggle with it. And I know that even if I don't lock the door, I'm probably okay. People with insider delusional beliefs are going to probably say something like, nope, the, the door is unlocked. Even if I locked it, I'm not safe. Even the people are going to do everything they can to break into my house, even if, and it starts to get like the reality of that, the proportion of the pie starts to get so slim that people are convinced that this thing has happened or that it is going to happen. I am convinced that I'm going to be canceled. I am convinced that the stove is on, no matter what you tell me. That's where we really need some uh, uh, some serious treatment. And again, the reason that we're talking about this in terms of people needing treatment is because of how unbelievably debilitating this is. <clears throat> some of what you've described sound like trauma response. How do you distinguish between anxious and what if trauma versus OCD? This is where an assessment is involved. Um, and this is where differential diagnosis is important because some of these things can happen in the context of PTSD. And if we can connect these things to trauma and that person fits the criteria for PTSD, that is the diagnosis we're going to go with. And that is the thing we're going to treat. We can still treat obsessions and compulsions, even if a person doesn't necessarily fit the criteria for the disorder. But that's where differential diagnosis is so unbelievably important. Okay, so let's talk treatment, and then we're going to talk about how to support people who are struggling with this. So there's a couple things that I am going to uh, talk about here. The first one is one of the things that we need to do uh, in a global sense is we need to restructure the autopilot. And we basically need to um, fix, and I don't generally like the word fix as it relates to mental health, but in this case, I, it works. Uh, we need to fix the anxiety mitigation protocol, or the AMP. Because the anxiety mitigation protocol, as it currently stands, is not working and is not being registered, which means we need to bring in, uh, so we need to bring in some real intention and uh, consciousness to this process. Two, what we need to do is we need to help a person build distress tolerance. I actually have a video on YouTube about distress tolerance, so I'm not going to go too far into uh, what distress tolerance actually is and how to mitigate it, but I will talk about it as it relates to this process. When you act on a compulsion relative to an obsession, what you are actually doing is reinforcing the obsession itself. A lot of people don't realize this. They think that when they check the lock over and over that it's going to make it better, that it's going to help convince that person that they are safe. 
and that their door is locked and that they're good and that their anxiety is no longer warranted. But that is not actually the case. In the long term, what you're doing is you're building up a mythos that the what if has more power and you are slowly moving that pie to the disproportionate one that we do not want. Okay. So what we have to do is engage the in restructuring the mitigation protocol, when a person addresses the stimulus, we have to build distress tolerance so that they do not kick over into this feedback loop. And the way that you build distress tolerance is over time. So the example of locking doors that we've been using if I'm the therapist in that moment and I walk them through that process, I'm literally with them. They go downstairs, they lock the door, and they walk back up. As soon as the obsession comes in, the override, the what if that comes in that says, wait a minute, what if I didn't? Literally at that point, the timer starts. You hit the timer. And you say, we are going to go as long as we possibly can without you acting on that compulsion. And maybe the person gets to like five minutes and they start squirming and they just can't handle it. And they're like, please, please, please let me go downstairs and check the lock, please. And you may think I'm being dramatic, but I'm not. This is what it looks like. Please, please, please. Like, come on. I can't think about anything else. Please let me go check the lock. I, I, I can't. What if somebody comes in? What if somebody breaks in right now? Like, I need to know that it's locked. If it's not locked, I can't even pay attention to this session. I can't. Ah, this is where panic starts to come in, right? At, at some point, you hang in there as long as you can. And let's see the person makes it five minutes and 31 seconds. And you go, okay. You go, you like, and they go, I have to check the lock. And they go and they break it and they check the lock. And they go do this whole thing again, right? They check the lock. They see that it's locked. They feel good. They think they've mitigated it. But then they come back up and now they're back into the what ifs again. You start the clock again. And you got to beat five minutes and 31 seconds. Even if it's five minutes and 32 seconds, you have to beat it. You have to beat the clock. And you sort of gamify it a little bit for folks. But what that does over time is it starts to recalibrate your brain to where your brain starts to realize, I do not have to act on this immediately. You're disrupting the feedback loop. I do not have to do that. I can wait longer. And what I tell folks when I'm working with them is that what we're ultimately trying to do is we're trying to space out the amount of time that's between the obsessions that you experience. And we're also trying to space out the amount of time between when you have an obsession and when the compulsion happens. And that is what brings me to number three, which is space out obsessions and space out obsessions to compulsions. We want to add as much time as we possibly can between these things. And what happens is when we start to actually implement some of the forms of treatment, where we start to talk about the pie, we start to talk about alternative behaviors, like we did when we talk about like take a picture or whatnot. When we start to talk about these things, what I often tell people is if you hang in there with it, if we build the distress tolerance associated with it, what you're going to notice is that your time between when the obsessions pop into your mind and drive you crazy is going to space out. And it may be that you only start to experience the obsessions maybe once a week instead of once a day. Or we get to a point where maybe the obsessions kind of come through your mind and you are like, okay, that's, uh, here they are. And then you do the coping strategies that we've developed and then you move on throughout your day. So space, we also want to space out when I have an obsessive thought and then I want to act on it with a compulsion, we want to space that out and we need to, we need to create more and more and more time. And we do that through distress tolerance. Here's the thing. And I'm going to zoom out again for this one, because this is, again, it's a very important point. Working through OCD is painful. It is not easy. I have to tell every single person that ever works with me with OCD you are going to hate this process. It is going to be miserable. You are going to have times where you are going to hate me for the stuff that I tell you you've got to do in order to kick this. There is no way to treat OCD 
that does not involve pain. Because we tend to see low distress tolerance in folks that experience OCD. You are going to have to be uncomfortable. You are going to have to fight through the desire to act on the obsessions. You are going to have to experience the pain of what it means to not just trust yourself, but to trust other people and to trust your memory and to trust the actual proportionate pie. These are not things that happen overnight. There are times where I have worked with folks for years on trying to mitigate the OCD because of how painful it is. There are some folks we've managed to knock it out in a couple months, but this is a mentally painful process. If you are a person that struggles with OCD or you know somebody who struggles with OCD and you want to work on it and have it treated by a professional who knows what they're doing, you have to be prepared for it to be painful. It is not going to be easy. And I'm not saying that to deter people. I'm saying that to help you develop realistic expectations about treatment for OCD. OCD is painful, but so is the treatment. And it's really, it's, it's a shame that that's the case. But the good news is OCD has a very good prognosis. When people actually put the time into this, you actually will see drastic improvement in their lives. Uh, and I anecdotally can tell you that's the case with as somebody who has worked with a lot of people who struggle with OCD. Okay, so the other things what we want to do is we want to flip the proportions, okay, or the proportion pie, as I talked about it. And one of the ways that we do that, this is sort of like 4B, is through a concept that I like to call equal weighting. Okay. And here's how equal weighting works real quick. This is also a concept that even if you don't have OCD, you can actually integrate this into your life pretty well. So if, uh, if thing A gets a certain amount of effort and energy with it, when you consider, whether considered or experienced, okay? Thing B, you could also call these possibilities, has to also receive equal energy and most of us don't do this. Okay, so most of us will think, so let's take thing A is uh, somebody could break into my home. If that gets a huge amount of energy if that gets a block of pink that's this big and the amount of energy you put into that thought is this big and if that thing happens like let's say the stove is left on or the door is left unlocked and you just spend all your time and energy thinking about that when the alternative happens okay i'm going to put in parentheses alternative for example, the stove is off or the door is locked, you have got to give that equal energy. Most people do not do that. What most people do, uh, when they're particularly when they're experiencing OCD, is they will give it maybe an amount that the green has. And they'll just sort of like, you know, okay, cool, yeah, no, so the, the stove's off. Doesn't matter, I'm back over here. But what if? And this is where the data part of anxiety mitigation protocol comes into play because we have to look at data for the alternative and you have to equally weight them. If you are going to be devastated, I'm going to talk about this in a couple of uh, circumstances. If when your partner does not text you for two hours, you are devastated, that's thing A. But then there's a moment where your partner does text you regularly. You do not get to disproportionately put energy into the what if or into the lack of texting. You can be angry about it for sure, but then you also have to put an equal amount of appreciation into when the thing that you requested happens. So with OCD, if, you, if you're going to give a huge amount of energy to the stove being on when you check it, if in that 1% chance you went and checked it and the stove was on, you have to give that equal amount of energy to any time you go back and look at the stove and it's off. And the reason that we do that is because that's how we restructure the autopilot. It's how we help people start to find data. We, we, we need to find data to support that you're okay. 
and that the thing that you're worried about is actually not something you have to compulsively act on. So I hope this makes sense, but this is what I talk about with the concept of equal weighting. It's something that particularly with OCD we need to work through because most people do not equally weight when they're, when they're dealing with OCD. They'll, they'll take the other stuff for granted or they won't pay attention to it or they won't commit it to memory in the same way that they will the, uh, the bad stuff and you have to do that. Okay, next, number five. Uh, one of the other things that we have to do is we have to focus on choice. And what I, when we look at this, if we take the lock, what we would do is I would actually sit down with a person and I would walk through this sequence with them and I would encourage them to look at every single part of this sequence where they have a choice. And we need to focus on that. Okay, So asking the question, is the door locked? Asking the what if of what if it isn't. Saying I'll be killed if not. Those are cognitive choices. A person is choosing to select those possibilities out of the infinite library of possibilities. And it's important to see that as a choice because if we see that as a choice, that means that there is a choice to engage with the alternative. That's going to be difficult to do at first, but we want to get a person to say like, what if it is locked? Or there's, I may not be killed, if, the, if even if the door is unlocked, right? Or is the, is the door unlocked? Or it is locked. But we have to get people into engage, like seeing those thoughts and obsessions as choices of things that we can respond to when they come through and we can counter with some of this equal weighting. The other thing is the compulsions themselves, their behaviors. Behaviors inherently are choices for the most part. So when you stand up out of your chair, and you go to walk downstairs to go check the lock, every single moment of that sequence is a choice. The physical feeling that you have is not a choice. The anxiety that comes along with this is not a choice, but it is something that you actually can perpetuate through your choices. If you choose, after locking the door, you made the note, you know you locked the door. If you choose to stand up, walk outside, go down the stairs and look at the lock again, you have reinforced the anxiety. You have told the anxiety, you know what? You're right. I did need to check that. You go downstairs and you check it and you go, okay, I'm good. And you come back upstairs. You, that entire sequence of behavior was a choice. And all the things you were thinking as you were going through that and your, your more your responses to those thoughts were your choice. And so part of treatment here is helping people validate the anxiety, but then focus on where their choices are. Too many people focus on trying to change the feeling. We're not going to change the feeling. The anxiety is not going away. That's why we have to build the stress tolerance because the anxiety is going to be there. We just have to help you build the stress tolerance and learn mitigation protocol that actually is going to diminish it in the long term. Okay, so that's the that's number five. You're going to see there's a lot. There's quite a few of these because um, again, treating OCD is not easy. The other thing we have to do is we have to build internal reassurance. Now, to some extent, this is a byproduct of some of these other things, but when a person locks the door and then they say to themselves, okay, I locked the door and I see that I locked the door and I'm going to reassure myself that I have done what I can to keep myself safe, we have to really build and reinforce that narrative. We have to be intentional about it. We have to pay attention to it and we have to be able to engage with it in the time, in the space between obsessions and compulsion. We have to build a sense of trust in ourselves and in our perceptions. For some folks, this is easier than others. But people with very poor or absent insight, this internal reassurance takes a long time. For people that have good insight or fair insight, this sometimes takes less time. But I need to make sure that I highlight here, chat, the focus on in Internal, because sometimes what people will do is they will rope other folks into it and they will seek external reassurance. You do not want external reassurance to be a primary component of working through this. This would be like if I was to ask my wife, is the door locked? Even the, Can you check the door? No, I have to internally 
reassure myself that this is the case. It's okay once in a while to work with friends and family to help you through this, but you don't want to rope them into this process. It can be pretty painful. They can have understanding of this process, but there are ways to support people with OCD that don't include actually perpetuating it by enabling it through your responses. And it have to, you have to disrupt a person seeking that out. Okay, so internal reassurance is something that we are working to try to develop for a person. And this literally just sounds like, if you want to know what this sounds like, it's, okay, I'm putting my hand on the lock. I am turning the lock. I heard it click. I'm going to pull the door once. Okay, the door is locked. I am anxious about whether it would be, but I have just locked the door, which is very important to me. I am going to pay significant attention to the fact that the door is locked right now. The door is locked. I have locked it. I may still be worried about this, but I know that the door is locked. I am. I have done what I am supposed to do. I am going to walk upstairs, and I am going to remind myself as I walk up the stairs that I have locked the door. I have done what I am supposed to do. I am safe. I am also going to pay attention to the point that up until this point, if this is true, nobody has broken into my home. And then when the thought starts to float in, no, oh, you didn't, you didn't lock it. What if you didn't? Say, I understand where that's coming from. That's anxiety speaking. I know that I have locked the door. I am going to sit here and I'm going to focus on doing something else. I have locked the door. I am okay. That is what that sounds like. Very hard to do at first. You need some, you usually need a therapist to help instill that in you. What I often say to people is there are times where I wish I could be with you when we do the alternative behavior because I need to be there to help prop you up a little bit until you and to sort of scaffold it until you can do it yourself. And I do that in sessions. Okay. Number seven. Uh, what we need to do again as a byproduct here is we need to recondition a person. This is really, I mean, seriously, this is a product of all of these things. What we're essentially doing is reconditioning a person's response to their anxiety. And we're reconditioning their behaviors. And I don't mean that in like this like training manipulative way. What I mean is that we're reconditioning our relationship to our anxiety and to the compulsions themselves. And then finally, what we're going to do is we are going to develop, uh, I never remember if this is an E or an A for maintenance, whatever. Um, we're going to develop maintenance. And this is uh, things like coping strategies, uh, which are relative to the person. This is how we're going to um, check in every once in a while. This is how we're going to develop more insight. And this is also how we're going to make sure that we're constantly putting things in context. Uh, it could be helpful, putt dog. Um, I've worked in not reinforcing negative thoughts with mindfulness meditation. Would that be helpful for OCD? Is it different from general anxiety that it wouldn't? It could help. Uh, any amount of intention that we can put into this process, uh, the better right? Because this tends to be an autopilot response for people. And so when I'm talking about restructuring the autopilot, this is part of the process of doing that. Um, now I'm going to put this uh, last point as a caveat. I can't talk too much about this because I am not a psychiatrist. However, there are times where people uh, can use SSRIs or anti-anxiety medication But you must, 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 must talk to a psychiatrist for this. Okay. I cannot recommend or prescribe medication. There are some folks where medication has helped. There are others where it has not. The reason that I mention this, though, is because this reinforces the point that when we're talking about SSRIs and anti-anxiety medication, it kind of reinforces the point that this is all about anxiety mitigation. That like OCD, if you can lower a person's baseline anxiety with medication, it allows them to access some of these alternative thoughts a little bit more effectively. 
to where maybe the distress tolerance can be built a little bit more easily. We can flip the proportions a little bit more easily because the distress tolerance is a little bit more there because the anxiety has been mitigated a little bit with the medication. Medication alone is not likely to kick this. This is why research time and again always talks about how medication plus talk therapy is really where we're going to see the most effects. But SSRIs and anti-anxiety meds can be an option um, as it relates to this stuff. Um, and sometimes it can help people. <clears throat> I can think of one person in particular that I've worked with where it made a huge difference. When we uh, when I coordinated with the psychiatrist. Okay. So this is generally what treatment looks like. It's different for everybody, but there's a lot of behaviors we have to replace, a lot of cognitions we have to replace. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a common approach for working with OCD, although I also prefer to bring in some of the emotional components of it because OCD at the end of the day is a very emotional uh, disorder. And it's one where we are doing everything we can to try to mitigate that emotional experience. Where again, the we are a person with OCD is essentially struggling with this process of going from uncertainty to certainty. And they have developed uh, problematic processes for trying to manage that very simple process. All right, final part before I take questions is what can you do to support? So is there, if there's somebody in your life uh, that struggles with OCD uh, or, I mean, I guess you, if you yourself struggle with OCD and are diagnosed with it, please make sure that you're continuing to work with your therapist on, on that and developing these strategies. But there's a few things that I want to offer and you're going to probably look at this list and you're going to think, wow, Dr. Mick, that's very limited. Isn't there more I can do? No, you are not a person's therapist. You are not responsible for managing a person's OCD. You're responsible for being a good friend and family member. And often what that means is first and foremost, encourage therapy. And I don't mean this as like, go to therapy. What I mean is, hey, you seem like you're really struggling. There are people out here who can really help you with this. And this is actually something that's got a good prognosis if you do. One of the best ways that you can encourage people to go to therapy is to talk about your own, especially if positive. If you have had a good experience in therapy, talk about it. It makes a huge, diff huge, 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 huge difference for people, okay? But encourage therapy, and what I mean by this is professional involvement. Do not ever, under any circumstance, Encourage a life coach. It's a big no-no here at Dr. Mick. Okay. So beyond that, though, what are the little bit more tangible ones? Empathy. In particular, empathy... Come on. In particular, empathy for the emotional experience. Okay. Not... The obsessions. Okay. So I see that you are anxious. I see that you are afraid. I see that you are struggling. I see that you are confused. Devote your energy to sitting with the person's emotional experience and acknowledging the emotional experience. There is a tendency at times for people with OCD to want to fact check with people around them and get confirmation that their obsessions are legitimate. And I'm here to tell you that that is immensely, immensely tiring. Uh, it is not something that you're going to be able to help a person with. So you want to stay away from uh, encouraging and like re uh, reinforcing people's obsessions. And the way that you do that is boundaries. You need help setting healthy boundaries. Watch my lecture about it. You have got to have boundaries with folks. You have to know your limitations. If you, if a person is continually seeking excessive reassurance from you and is overly including you in their obsessions and compulsions, or if those compulsions are affecting you personally, you need to set boundaries with that person. 
particularly if that person is not attending therapy and seeing a therapist. You are not responsible for this person's obsessions and compulsions. You can support them through empathy. You can say, hey, I see that you're struggling. At the same time, no, I am not going to check the lock for you. Um, it's it, And that is kind of where like you really want to coordinate with a person's like with a person's therapy, like if the person says like, look, my therapist told me I shouldn't be checking the lock and that I shouldn't be checking with you to check it, then make sure you're following that, which leads me to number three. And I know I already made this point and I zoomed out to make it, but it is important. Don't joke about it. If a person's afraid of the lock being unlocked, do not unlock it and go, what the hell, man, you missed the lock. They're afraid of the stove. Being, don't turn the stove on and say, geez, the stove's been on for like three hours. It's not funny. It is not funny. Take this seriously. If there are ways in which it affects you, set boundaries. But as far as it relates to how the other person is experiencing it, just don't make it worse. Okay? Take it seriously when people tell you this stuff. If there are certain boundaries that they need to have, if they're working on like, hey, I'm really trying to make sure that I don't check the lock, uh, don't bring it up. Allow them to work on it. In fact, you might also encourage them when you see the alternative behavior. Like, hey, I noticed you haven't checked the lock today. That's awesome. Don't underestimate the power of social reinforcement around this stuff. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so number four, I just said it, is encouragement. And number five is, if possible, I cannot understate how helpful it can be to attend therapy with that person so that the therapist can facilitate a conversation about, here's how you can help this person. Here is how we can systemically look at this. Here's how I can see your role in this. And it allows the therapist to tell you directly, hey, don't, you know, don't do this or do do this can make a huge difference. So if you are able and that person is willing to bring you in, att attend with that person. If you're a parent of a teenager or a young adult who is struggling with OCD and they live with you, see if you can attend a session in order to support them in that. Uh, it really can make all the difference. If you're the spouse or the partner or partners of somebody who is struggling with this, offer to go so that you can learn directly how to be supportive of the fact that they're struggling with this. You have to remember, as I've said of many times in this lecture, it is immensely, immensely difficult to deal with OCD. And it is something that uh, needs a lot of support. And it also needs the right support. And seeing a therapist like me who specializes in working with it and having the right support system around you can make all the difference. OCD has a really good prognosis. It really does. If you put the work in, if you engage with these things, if you consider what I'm talking about and working with your therapist, there is a good chance that you're actually going to be able to work through it and be able to live your life in a meaningful way. So those are kind of my thoughts. Um, you don't have to push joining. Yes, it's a good point. Don't push joining with therapy sessions, but do offer it. It can really make a difference for a person. <clears throat> so when I'm talking about not empathizing with the obsessions, what I mean by that, Isaac, is um, when a person tries to rope you into the obsessions and seeking confirmation for the obsessions and is kind of pulling you into the anxiety of that, that is not where you want to devote your supporting energy. Don't, don't think about it. It's like, it's not like, okay, well, let's problem solve that. And let's talk about like that. No, no, no. Go to the emotion. Go to the, I see that you're anxious about something. Respond to the emotion itself. Say, I don't, I, I can't really help you much here with like what you're anxious about, but I can certainly acknowledge that you are anxious. That is the way that you want to handle that. So in conclusion, OCD is incredibly difficult to navigate. It is a way of mitigating anxiety that actually makes it worse. It is something that many people struggle with. If you're struggling with it, there is hope. The work will be difficult, but you can do it. Uh, and it is something that really should be taken seriously and is not something that should be tossed around 
to talk about quirkiness. Like, I really hope that in me talking about this in the way that I have, that you are reconsidering the use of saying OCD in very benign contexts. People who struggle with this do not want to have it. I would not wish it on my worst enemy. I, I have seen people's lives been ruined by this. I have also seen uh, the hope and the excitement when people are actually starting to see their work that they put in in therapy make a difference though. So I really do encourage you to get help, encourage your friends to get help if this is something that they're struggling with. Um, this is only scratching the surface. I, I have not gone into the depths of OCD. This is designed to be an introduction to it. And I hope that maybe this has helped you understand a little bit more of how this works. These are the types of things that I explain to clients throughout my work with them. Um, but I also am able to fit their subjective experience into this. I realize that this lecture is not going to speak to the depth um, of everybody's uh, experience, but it is something that uh, I think you know might help conceptualize it a little bit. And again, if you have watched this lecture and you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, this really feels like this, this could be me, please talk to a mental health professional about that. And so thanks for watching this. Uh, I'm gonna take questions now, so I hope you stick around for the questions, but I'm, I'm gonna go to Discord first and then I will take some uh, some questions from chat, so. Oh my God, there are a lot of them. Holy shit. Oh wait, no, I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay, never mind. Sorry, I was looking at questions for Dr. Mick. I was like, oh my God. <clears throat> uh, Knucklebat, so how should somebody go about suggesting help for somebody else that believes there isn't help for OCD? Uh, show them this lecture, explain that there actually is help out there, but you can't convince them of anything. It's just, you know, let them know what you know and say, hey, I respect your decision, but there actually is help out there. And maybe you might want to watch this guy talk about it. Okay, so I'm going to burn through some of these questions and then I'm going to take some from chat here. What are some of the least known symptoms of OCD and who would uh, be able to diagnose us with it? A licensed meth, uh, mental health professional is who can di uh, diagnose this. Uh, anybody who uh, hold, either holds a master's degree and is under supervision or anybody who is licensed uh, is able to diagnose this. Uh, some of the least known symptoms, I think people don't really understand just how debilitating uh, the obsessions can be and uh, that a lot of people will try to hide this stuff. Uh, but I think maybe the one of the lesser known things is that this is prolonged. This is something that happens over long periods of time. This isn't just like an acute burst. <clears throat> um, OCD is not really on a spectrum. I got quite like, is OCD on a spectrum? OCD is, I suppose I should do this. OCD is not really on a spectrum so much as there are degrees of severity. A person's insight into the obsessions themselves is a huge um variable that affects maybe how hard working through it is going to be but some people experience ocd that's relatively manageable and the fact that it like what it does cause distress in their life for uh, maybe isn't super debilitating and then there are other people where like it literally controls their life uh, there are some folks like for example like compulsive shopping where if a person has the money to do it and it's not actually causing too many problems like financially uh but is causing problems in their relationship that can certainly be an example where like, you know, maybe it's not the most severe thing ever where a person's putting themselves in danger or something like that, but it's still not great and it's still distressing and the person still fits the criteria. Uh, let's see. What are some signs to be aware of as things that might indicate that you should talk to your therapist about potentially having OCD? If there are thoughts and actions that you're engaging in that feel out of your control that are completely destroying your life and there's a lot of rep repetition to it I, at that point i would recommend talking to somebody about it is ocd a permanent diagnosis or can it be improved to a point that it won't affect somebody anymore it can absolutely be uh, improved to a point where it doesn't affect somebody particularly if you learn different strategies if you really do uh, fix the autopilot if you rework the anxiety mitigation protocol absolutely it has a great prognosis and people can get better from it uh, i have seen um people go from uh, literally throwing away everything in their home to being able to be in a messy home without being like a realistically messy home and live their life totally okay. I have seen people go from debilitating thoughts that prevent them from being able to do their job to being able to get promotions because they've learned how to manage it well. Uh, I've seen a broad spectrum of people. I've also seen people who struggle, who have a really hard time breaking through it. Um, 
and it takes more work and it takes more time. But it is, uh, I just think it's very important to understand that the work on OCD is not easy at all. Is OCD hereditary? So super interesting. Um, we don't entirely know uh, whether OCD is hereditary. However, there is some indication that if you have somebody in your immediate proximity family-wise who struggles with OCD, there is more of a likelihood that it can develop. So there's a lot of environmental factors that affect OCD. Uh, OCD is also more commonly diagnosed in women, um, but, all, but it shows up with men often earlier on in life. So uh, we don't know anything. We don't have any information to, to this point about non-binary folks. I, I, it sucks that a lot of this stuff is still in the binary. But uh, men, we often see it a little bit earlier on, but it seems to be more diagnosed in women. There could definitely be some sexism involved in that, though, as there is with almost any kind of diagnosis. So you do have to take that with a grain of salt. Is there a link between autism and OCD? Uh, from what I understand, <clears throat> um, and I would probably need to do some extra digging on this. If a person is diagnosed with autism, it is unlikely that they would be diagnosed with OCD because many of the behaviors that they're experiencing could be attributed to autism. So when we're, and this is why it's really important within the differential diagnosis component of this, that if we can explain some of these behaviors elsewhere with other, and a person fits a different diagnosis, then it is unlikely that this would be a diagnosis that would be rendered. And again, that's on your mental health professional to determine. But I, I have not in my nine years of being a therapist ever seen OCD and autism diagnosed together. Uh, let's see. How was the definition for OCD in the DSM-5 developed? Is it based on research or population level data, et cetera? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I know that uh, the DSM as a whole is like this huge undertaking of psychologists that handle it. Um, but I think we're mostly looking at like anecdotal data. We're also looking at research. There has been some brain studies that have done on people with OCD where you see like interesting like anomalies in the prefrontal cortex in certain aspects of the brain. But the majority of that research that I've read um, is kind of like inconclusive in terms of like if there's actually like a brain thing that we can associate with OCD. At the very least, we don't understand it well enough yet to make a call on it. Um, also for outsiders, like a roommate to try to interrupt one of these routines or feedback loops, could that be more harmful than helpful? Uh, it could be more harmful. That's why I suggest that you be involved in the therapeutic process or to have your roommate, like relay that information of how you can be helpful to them because there are ways in which you might actually make it worse. Uh, or you might overly take accountability away from their needing to work on it. So be careful with that. Where do you draw the line between preferences and OCD? For example, with cleanliness. OCD is going to be something that a person will engage with to a debilitating degree in a way that feels completely out of their control. So having preferences is totally fine. Like I like when my room is laid out a certain way. I like when my desk is laid out a certain way, but it doesn't cause me like severe distress in my life to have it a little bit out of order. If somebody came in and moved my stream deck over and then like I literally could only, f I couldn't focus on anything else and I you know, delay going to dinner with my wife and I cancel the rest of my evening because I have to make sure that the stream deck is absolutely perfect and is exactly where it should be. And blah, blah. that's when we start talking about potential obsessions and, uh, and compulsions there as opposed to a preference. So the line is generally like most mental illness and uh, disorders is when it has caused severe um, distress in other areas of the life uh, and where it prevents you from your daily functioning. Can trauma, like the loss of a loved one, worsen symptoms or behaviors? Yes, um, it can. And sometimes it can also produce this. Like OCD can be a byproduct of trauma. Not all trauma experiences lead to PTSD. Uh, and again, PTSD and OCD, we see them uh, in the same conversation very frequently. And the way, again, that a, that a professional will distinguish these things is if we can explain things like hypervigilance, uh, if we can explain like control of the environment, certain types of obsessions and the patterns among them, certain types of compulsions and the patterns among them as being attributed to either a nodal instance of trauma or chronic trauma, and the person fits the criteria for PTSD, then we're going to go with PTSD. If the person doesn't fit other criteria for PTSD, but certainly fits the criteria for OCD and the onset was in the wake of a traumatic experience or experiences, then it would be OCD.
So this is where differential diagnosis is super important. You rarely will see them together though. Um, I have not in my nine years as a therapist. see um i've never been formally diagnosed with ocd but i've been in therapy for intrusive thoughts for over three years should i seek medication if i find myself getting panicked a few days after a session you should talk to your therapist about that wonka um your therapist and you should uh, be able to work with that if you're not currently seeing a therapist and you're consider and you're experiencing the panic or whatnot i encourage you to certainly see like your primary care physician or to seek out like a psychiatrist or a therapist you can talk about that and see how that might help but i can't recommend uh whether you do that or not If a compulsion can be linked to a past trauma, do you first have to address the trauma or can you first focus on the choice of the compulsion? Do both have to be addressed? This is a very common question with trauma in particular, and we'll deal with this when I talk about trauma in a later lecture, but uh, it depends. A lot of times the reason that people will come talk to you about, like will come talk to me about OCD is because it's affecting their life now. And a lot of times people will say, I don't really give a shit where it came from. It's causing a lot of problems now and they wanna work on the behavioral manifestations. Everything that I talked about in this lecture, we can talk about without talking about the origin of where it came from. However, as part of my assessment before rendering a diagnosis, I, as the therapist, have to ask the questions that are necessary in order to determine whether this potentially is linked to trauma and whether this person fits within PTSD. This is why therapists do assessments, because we have to figure out and sort of ballpark and figure out where you fit. Again, it's not an exact science. We are not perfect at it. Um, but a person who is experienced in working with OCD, like I am, and I also work with trauma, I know how to distinguish those things through assessment. These are great questions. Um, I also want to take a second just to acknowledge uh, those of you that have become members. Um, thank you for that. I have the same checking the stove, locking the door thing when I leave my flat for a few hours, but I'm only out maybe a half hour. Uh, I have no problem. Thoughts? If it's causing distress in your life to a point where it's starting to impede your functioning, you should talk to a therapist. Um, I cannot diagnose anybody here with OCD or tell you that it might be or might not be. Um, I'm only here to be able to provide general information. If it's causing distress in your daily life, talk to a therapist. Talk to somebody who can do an assessment and figure out, you know, maybe it's just some extra anxiety around it and it's no big deal. Maybe it is part of a broader um, issue. I, I will say though, again, in general, that like people who are diagnosable with OCD it's not generally like a, well, I don't know. It's like a, this really sucks and I really need to get this figured out. So any other questions before I wrap up this VOD portion of what we're doing? I'm going to stick around a little bit after this for those of you that are here live, but I want to make sure that any questions that are related to this, even if they're questions that I missed, I want to make sure that I answer them as part of a VOD so that I have them available to people who will watch this down the line. I have something similar. I don't go ahead with anything without well laid out plan and without a safety net, but I wouldn't look at it as OCD since I don't get upset by it. Yeah, and that's okay. That's okay. Your experience is something that's very important. The, the point of a therapist, I will say this, is for us to take our, ex like for me example, to take my experience and my knowledge of OCD and to combine that with a person's subjective experience and work with them to develop a treatment plan that's right for them. Mm. Anything you can say about OCD in children? It is rarely diagnosed in children. Occasionally you will see it uh, before the age 10, but the mean age is 19 and a half years old. Very rare for us to see OCD in children. Uh, usually if you see OCD in children, my first thought is trauma, uh, as opposed to the development of like OCD. You said OCD has a good prognosis. How common is it to have periods where you increase distress tolerance and get better, and then times where it is debilitating again? Depends on the person. Um, I've certainly seen that. I've had people that I worked with for several months that got better, so to speak. And they, you know, basically I look at it as like went into remission and then contacted me a couple years later and were like, hey, some of this stuff's starting to come back again. Can we work on it? That happens. And that's why I say as part of a treatment plan, maintenance is a part of it. Because it's not something where like you just, you go, you, you hammer it out and then boom, you're on your way. There's maintenance protocols that you want to, that you want to put in place as well. For those with friends or family who might make light of the I'm so OCD jokes, what are appropriate ways to address and correct them about it? 
I think it's just to say like, hey, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from when you say this, but like you want to, usually what you, I would say is like, you want to be careful where you say that, okay? Like if you're in a group of friends and somebody says it, like I, I'm not of the mind that you have to like censor people and overly police their language when you're in a group with them. Although I do think when you have like super, pro like if a person saying like racist shit while they're around you, you should call that out, right? But if a person says like, oh, you know, yeah, my OCD wants me to have my desk straight or whatever. I think the way that you can do it is say like, hey, you know, I know what you mean when you say that, but you might want to be careful with how you say that because um, you may you may actually cheapen the experience of a person who legitimately struggles with OCD. You might even say like, hey, I just I don't really appreciate when you use that language. I'd rather you didn't use it when you're around me. That's the best you can do. Can you have OCD about anything? Can it manifest in infinite ways? Yes. Um, What's kind of nice about the diagnostic criteria for OCD is that it is not super limiting to content. So it can kind of happen with anything. And it is something that um, usually what we're going to be looking for is like how, not how regular, how irregular is it content wise. We're looking at like, how do those obsessions manifest and what are the compulsions and do they fit? And are we talking about have to's and like a broken anxiety mitigation protocol, right? So like there are certain content that's going to stand out more to a person. And there are certainly things that a person with OCD will consider like tends to see as intrusive, right? Like, you know, I could certainly attend to the idea, like maybe I'll get canceled at some point, but like, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to like actively get all, you know, obsessive about it uh it's so it really just it can be an infinite number of ways but that's why we really want to work with people to develop this alternative protocol for how to navigate it because um sometimes you can it's sort of like a plug and play to some extent can eating disorders be worsened by ocd so eating disorders versus ocd is a very interesting topic it's one that probably could have its own lecture uh generally if we have an eating disorder involved um, yeah, if a person would also fit the criteria for, o for OCD, we're probably going to be looking at the eating disorder as potentially more severe, but there's, uh, some debate about whether OCD and eating disorders can be, uh, lumped together. Like usually what happens is if a person's dealing with an eating disorder, we're going to go for that, uh, instead of looking at it as OCD. So, um, yeah, but it's, uh. It's one of those things that like can certainly affect different things and and play off of uh, other things. Man, all right, good stuff. Well, VOD watchers, if you have any questions, you are certainly welcome to ask in the comments. Um, my ability to respond to those may be somewhat limited, but I will respond to comments if I can. I would love it if you watched this and you made it to the end. If you leave a comment, let me know what you thought about this lecture. If you think it could help somebody in your life, please share it. Uh, I really hope, I know this was an introduction to it. I know I couldn't get to like every single thing that this has. Uh, OCD is a huge topic. I could teach an entire seminar on it. Uh, but it is something that a lot of people struggle with. It's something that uh, I think it's important for us to have more accurate representation of. And I hope that by watching this, you learned a little bit about it and it helped to demystify some things and maybe helped you think about it in a way that is accessible to you because a lot of times this information is not. The entire point of why I do this channel is to try to bring this information to people in more of an accessible way. I do it responsibly and ethically. If you like this kind of content, drop a like on the video. Tell me in the comments that you like it. I'm going to continue to try to do more of these uh, going forward and make them more consistent. And we'll do a variety of topics. I do topics that I have expertise in. So there are some things that people will ask about where I just can't do one because I don't have the expertise. But the things that I do work with and do have a level of comfort talking about, I will uh, continue to do. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you follow me on social media down in the description. And again, if this, if this was meaningful to you in some way and you want to provide some financial support to the stream, you can do that by becoming a member by hitting the member button down below. You can also do that by sending me a tip through the stream elements link that's down in the description, or you could purchase some cool merch from drmcmerch.com. I really appreciate you coming out for this. I hope it was helpful and I will catch you on the next one.